Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will learn about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. We are honored to welcome to the show Township of Lanark Highlands in the province of Ontario, Deputy Reeve Bill King. Deputy Reeve, welcome to the show. Good morning, Chris. Thank you for having me. So uh, do you mind if I call you Bill during the interview or do you prefer no, Deputy do. Reeve? <laughs> no, not at all. Call me Bill. <laughs> Bill, uh, let's start with the big question I ask every municipal leader who's come on the show. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well... I didn't say for my family. I I got involved in politics quite early. My father used to take me to political events, and um, you know when 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 if there was an election on, and if the uh, candidates came to town, particularly the prime minister or the opposition leaders, he would take me there, and I and I sort of developed an interest in politics through that. Um. The first job I had in my career actually was as a journalist for a a daily newspaper in Northern Ontario, North Bay, where I grew up. And uh, so I covered the civic beat. I got to cover uh, City Hall, um, really got my first dose and my initial understanding of municipal politics through doing that. And then um, covered the school board as well. And... This is a very long story, so stop me whenever uh, it gets too boring. I love but, long uh, stories. If it wasn't a long story, it'd be a very bad interview for audio <laughs> and video purposes. So continue on. No problem. So, the, the, but and the chairman of the school board in Nipissing was a man by the name of Mike Harris. <laughs> yeah. uh, I got to know him quite well, and uh, when he went on to get elected as member of provincial parliament, I bumped into him the next day on the. On the street, we got talking, and the next thing you know, I was working for Mike Harris provincially. So that sort of got me involved in in public service and in uh, provincial politics, certainly quite active. And I I worked as a political staffer for him for many years. Um, maybe more pertinent to exactly what you, I think what you referred to was how did I get into this municipal job. And, and I, I would say, again, it's a result of sort of my involvement through provincial and now federal politics. I work for a federal member of parliament, which is my day job. And uh, so I've, I've been involved federally as well. Uh, again, involved in a number of uh, roles there. And I've always wanted to get elected myself and uh, go and not just help somebody do something, but do something myself. Um, I moved to Lanark 15 years ago. My children were three months old. I have I have twins, and uh, 15 year old twins. And uh, we moved to Lanark, and an election came up. And I thought I'm raising my family here. We're going to make our life here, and I want to see if I can make a contribution. So I ran for local council, and I was elected. So was, when uh, when was that? Because I was trying to do some research on you, and I I, I can't find any election results for Lanark Highlands before 2018 <laughs> for some reason. So when we, was the first election that you finally decided that you were going to put your name on the ballot? We we up, we've updated our website recently, and maybe some of the archive stuff didn't make uh, make the cut. I don't know. Um, I, this, I'm in my third term, so I uh, just finished one year of being deputy reeve. I had two four-year terms before that. So, so 2014 was when you were first Basically, elected. Basically, 2014 was the first election. So I want to go back to that first election because you seem like you were involved politically, but provincial and federal politics is a unique beast in itself because there's partisanship. There's uh, the blues versus the reds, the greens versus the orange, the purples versus whoever they're up against. But municipally, it's more of a clean slate. You're not running as a party. You're running as an individual. For you, was that experience running in that first election a unique experience? Because I'm assuming you have helped out on numerous provincial and federal campaigns. But putting yourself out there as not a party candidate, but as a personal candidate is probably something else. It it was completely different than anything I had done before. And you're right. I had helped many other candidates at all levels of government, including municipal, 
uh, with their election campaigns. Um, so it was uh, brand new for me. It was uh, it was exciting. It was exhilarating. Um, you do feel very much alone municipally. You're, you don't have the same party uh, support that you do in, in, at the other levels. Although the more longer I've been involved, I've built up what I would say is a sort of a network of, of good friends and supporters who helped me out. So I do have a network of people to rely on now um, to help me uh, uh, when I run for election. One of the things that I, I, I like to get to know about the certain areas of this country is the issues that are facing the uh, communities. I want to go back to that 2014 campaign that I want to sort of transpose the question to 2018 and then 2022. Um, for you, when you were door knocking and when you have door knocked in 2018, 2022, were there more municipal issues that were being raised at the door by the residents or were they more provincial and federal issues? Because, uh, when I talk to municipal leaders from across Canada, it, I often hear that there's more macro provincial or federal issues that municipal residents want to talk about during municipal elections. Was it the same for you in those three subsequent elections that you've ran and won? No, I I, I would say I would say in the early days in 2014 and when I ran again um, in, in uh, 2018, the the issues were very much local. There were concerns about uh, fire services, um, a fire master plan that was being developed and where the stations would be located. There were issues with, uh, uh, on the first council that I was in, it was a very controversial council because the, uh, not to air our dirty linen, but the uh, there were a number of members of that council who were bent on reforming town hall on basically eliminating all of the staff positions and uh, bringing in some new people. And it was very disruptive and, and uh, caused a lot of bad feelings. It really set the municipality back. So in those days, and then the second election was about fixing that mess that had been created by the first administration. And they, most of them lost their seats or the runner lost their seats. And so um, spent the second term kind of rebuilding of, and again, really focusing on, on local issues. Last election, I we did have a big local issue. There's no question, um, but it, one of the main things that we talked about and that we're dealing with right now, I guess, would be more provincial and federal in nature in the sense that it's dealing with the financial pressures that we're under. So, you know, we're affected by interest rates. We're affected by inflation. We're affected by all of these uh, uh, things that households are affected by things that are out of our control and we need to manage that. Our council brought in a, is a proposed very large double digit tax increase this year to deal with inflation and to deal with um, some previous budgets where believe it or not, we had a string of budgets where we had for years where we had zero or no tax increase. And it all sounded good at the time, except I think what, what's become apparent is that increasingly, <laughs> By spending less every year relative to the rate of inflation, we're actually providing fewer and fewer services. And we were getting strained in terms of our equipment renewals. Um, I happen to live in a very rural area. Um, and our road network is one of the largest in the country um, in terms of how many roads we have to plow in the winter, how many roads we have to maintain in the summer, uh, and bridges, of course, that we have to. So we're a very small municipality with a with a tiny commercial tax base. We rely almost exclusively on residential taxes to pay the freight, uh, which is really tough on, on the homeowners. And so, so that's the big issue that we've been seized with right now. Um, we also have another issue locally, though, that I would say about more mail about that than I did about a 12% tax increase. And it had to do with a proposed gravel pit that's uh, being proposed to be developed in an area near uh, quite a major tourist attraction in Lambert. So this has got the community up in arms, and I think rightfully so. I it's not, I haven't sort of declared my position. I want to see the, the process work its way through, but I'm very, very uh, skeptical that the, that the landfill is going to be able to make it through. 
Uh, well, I shouldn't speak for anybody else on council, but I'm skeptical at least that I, I'll be able to disagree. I want to talk about the financial issue first, and then we'll talk about some of the more micro issues like that gra uh, gravel pit that you were talking about. Yeah. Municipalities can't run deficits. You you either have to raise taxes or find other sources to uh, cover the cost of operations of the day to day services that the municipality provides. How do yeah. you see yourself and your role as uh, deputy reeve and as councillor for those first eight years uh, on uh, council? as balancing the needs of the community against the financial realities that people are, or municipalities are in, because I can imagine that people come to you on a day-to-day -day basis and ask for things that just are not in the financial scope of the municipality, whether it be a pool, whether it be a new paved road that they want or sidewalks or a new playground, but the financial reality is you just can't do it. How do you balance that? And how do you see your role as Deputy Reeve in working for the best of the community while trying to understand the needs of your residents? Yeah, I mean, you've just described the challenge of municipal government, basically. Um, and, 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 you know, I deal with things case by case, and I deal with things day by day. Um, I would say the electorate in our area is very understanding uh, with respect to um, our ability to provide services. Um, everybody, you know, we don't live in the city, and we're we're happy we don't, um, but we don't have transportation. We don't. We don't even have sewer and water hookups in, in the township. We're we're on uh, wells and septic. So uh, you know, as I say, garbage. We we have a village where people pay actually extra for garbage pickup on their tax bill every year. Um, but there are other areas where uh, every other area, I would say, you have to go to the dump. You have to bring your stuff to the landfill when you're ready to do that. So people, people that live there like that way of life and they're used to that and they don't have, I would say they don't have huge expectations, but there are basic expectations. And that's what I've been focusing on. You know, when I talk about the roads, we do have an arena. And it's falling into disrepair. We're putting some money into that to fix it up. That's part of the recovery program. And I, I think that's a great thing. Um, we have a museum. We have a library uh, in our village. We're very blessed to have all these things. Um, but they all come with a price. And, and, and there's a, a limit to what we can do. So basically, we're trying to hang on to what we have. Well, and, and but we're also trying to invest a little bit in the future. Fortunately for us, we are debt free. Um, we've we've managed the finances quite well. We can't run a deficit. Well, you can't budget for a deficit. Um, they don't chop off your hand if you uh, run a deficit. You you have to figure out how to pay for it from the next year's budget. But uh, you can't budget for a deficit, and and that's probably going to involve some boring for us this year. We have a million dollar bridge that has to get built one way or another and uh, uh, and that's just the way it is the other thing is and I a lot of municipalities are like this the and this is where it gets complicated for the electorate in terms of the taxation and the services we are a lower tier municipality um, we collect the taxes but we also Pay about a third of those taxes go straight just to pay for police services. We basically get a bill from the OPP and we, we pay it. And uh, the other third goes to pay for county government. Um, and that's sort of another element. And because I'm deputy reeve, I sit on county council as well. We haven't talked about that. Um, their focus is a lot more sort of administering provincial programs, public housing, public health. Um, uh, social services, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, seniors housing in the area is all run by the at the county level. Um, so it's confusing for people when you 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 get one tax bill. You know, we often say there's only one taxpayer, uh, but but Thailand, you divvy it all up. There's even less left for little old Lanark Island Township. So how do you advocate for Lanark Islands at the county level? Because um, 
I, I, I've covered municipal politics back in Ontario. I, I covered Durham Regional Council on a regular basis. And I can I, I, I can tell you that the smaller organizations that make up those regionals or those county councils often are not looked at or they get the crumbs when it comes to uh, social service funding or funding in general. How do you see your role as Deputy Reeve of Lanark County working in conjunction with the county to make sure that the issues of your community are addressed, but also that the funding isn't just an afterthought? The uh, several things I do. Uh, first of all, I'm a pretty strong personality, so I <laughs> your I Twitter would out. agree with that statement. <laughs> uh, I do speak my mind, and I'm not shy to advocate. Secondly, um, we are fortunate this year that the uh, uh, I'm the deputy reeve, the reeve of Lanark Highlands, also sits on county council, and for the first year uh, this year, he was elected warden. So we have a bit, we being Leonard Highlands has a bit more of a presence on county council with our guy being the warden. Um, it doesn't, it's not like we can sort of gerrymand everything in our direction, uh, but yeah, I'd say we get a little more respect and a little more time and attention from everybody. But um, third, county council, and, and you know, we talked earlier about uh, we don't have party politics in, in local government. I find that with local government, you're constantly developing relationships on different files with different counselors, and there's a lot of trading and credits that go back and forth. And there are times where I might help somebody in their area speak up for their cause. It really has nothing to do with Lanark Highlands. It's a different municipality, but um, I'll think that one of my neighboring municipalities, you know, I think they, that something needs to be said or advocated for them, and I'll do that. Um, so you you build up a bit of credit with the, the councillors who appreciate that, the mayors and reeves that are in those municipalities. And and so it's, it, but it's a little bit tricky sometimes because um, you're right. Uh, when you're a small municipality and you're, you're, uh, I would say our regional council is not totally dominated by the larger towns, but um, it, it's just a, a fact of life that, you know, most of the residents, most of the population, most of the tax base does come from those areas. So they do get a lot more attention. Do you see yourself, you talk about the bartering that happens around the county table. Well, you, you, you may work with a person who's not even in Lanark Islands, for an issue that's advocating for their community. Do you think that benefits the entire region and the entire county at the end of the day? Because we see provincial and federal, you're on one side of the aisle or the other side, and it doesn't really work out sometimes. And there's not that cross uh, partisanship or cross uh, uh, cross the aisle work that we often see at the municipal level. Municipal level to me is where the like the 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 stuff hits the road because that's where the majority of the day-to-day -day operations that people feel get done. That's where your roads are getting paved, your water is getting turned on if you are hooked up to water. That's where your garbage is picked up, where your landfill is being uh operated. Do you believe that that cross county, cross town work partisanship is beneficial to the residents of not only Lanark Highlands, but to the entire county? Well, it certainly, yeah, I think yes. Yeah, I, I would say everything's very collegial. Um, I, I think everybody's very respectful of their own community's needs. And uh, typically, um, when somebody ventures into a, an issue that's in a different municipality, say you're on county council and you want to talk about uh, a bridge in a different municipality than your own um, happens to be on the agenda that day. Um, typically, people venture in when they're supportive as opposed to when they're negative on it. I haven't seen too many examples of somebody coming in and saying, hey, you know, looks like we're going to pass this motion to give your municipality such and such, and I think that's a bad idea. There actually is an example where I won't mention what it is because bits of it are confidential, but there's something that's going to come to regional council shortly that I think regional council will probably turn down. I actually 
think I would vote for it. But I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I might be the only one that votes for it. It's going to pass. Do I really want to stick my head up and sort of use up a little bit of credibility on a, on a file where I may express an opinion, but it's not going to go anywhere and I'm not going to influence anybody and everybody's just going to think I'm a jerk. So I, I, I want to pick know, up on that. I apologize. I want to pick up on that for a second, because how important is it to you as a municipal counselor to stick true to your values? Because you're right. Sometimes you will look around the table and I've heard this, I've heard that exact same sentiment from municipal councillors from across Canada. They know things are not going to pass, but they believe in their heart it should. So they, or they should, it shouldn't, and it's going to pass. How important is it for you to stick to your values when you know something is in the benefit of the county or the uh, a township, but you know it's not going to pass, so you may not vote for it the way you are? Or are you willing to stick your hand up and say, you know what, I just don't think this is the right way, or yes, I think it's the right way? I would say at the township level, I always stick. I, I've been outvoted six to one a million times um i always i'm i'm usually the guy that says you know i'm the odd man out here and here's why um but again it's it's i know everybody quite well and it's very collegial and, and nobody takes offense by that um at the county level it's almost like i i will say i do hold my powder a little bit more and it's it's i tend to pick my battles and because I think I think I could wade into this and I could be the odd person, but all it's going to do is waste the consume a little bit of time. It's not going to change the vote. Um, there's there and there, I was going to say there's no media anyway. There's no uh, nobody covers county council the way they do the local council. And so sometimes a local council, I'll speak up because I would like to send a message to my constituents about where I am on an issue. Um, but you really don't have that opportunity, county council, the uh, unless there's a big festering issue where they come, they just they uh, you know don't get me into media ownership. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of our community uh, newspapers have been bought up by the biggies, and they don't uh, they don't do the news anymore. I agree wholeheartedly on that, and hence <laughs> why I'm I'm trying to shine a focus on municipal issues. Exactly. Um, we we talked earlier about the financial issues that uh, municipalities are facing, but municipalities are not alone in facing these issues. Residents are as well. You uh, are a level of government that is the closest to the people. So if you're you got have a double digit a tax increase, I'm assuming you're probably going to hear about it at the grocery store or at the post office when you go pick up your mail. How important is it to, for you to ensure that the budgets that are getting passed, the issues that are being raised are balancing the financial issue when it comes to residents' pocketbooks. Because if you raise double-digit taxes, that's coming out of people's pockets, and that could mean food on the table for someone. So I can imagine yeah. for someone like you, who who is so vocal on these issues, it's hard to understand that you have to plan for the future but you have to do it by sometimes raising taxes the the the, the increase that was approved by council was 12 percent. i actually moved an amendment to reduce it to 9.9 percent. .9%. i thought at least i could get it under 10 um but that would it was close actually we lost by that by one vote um yeah we had a lot of discussion and we still do and i'm still hearing from people um, who can't afford a tax increase. There, there's no question that there's some people out there. Um, the arguments in favor um, tended to focus around the fact that in our area, um, our uh, market valuations are relatively low um, and our taxes are based on our market value from MPAC. And so even if you live in a $500,000 house, your assessment at impact might only be half of that. So your taxes are on the assessment, not on the value. So that was the number one concern. People said, look, our houses have gone up in value. So this tax is going to be on top of that. And it's going to be like a double whammy. 
And so we, we explained to people that that won't happen in this case. Um, there's no good answer to people that are, are struggling. I mean, there's always people that are going to struggle and, 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 and there's a line out there for everybody, I suppose. And, and the question is, how do you deal that line? The 12% increase was rationalized by the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, we had like seven or eight years of zero or no, no tax increases. We we did some calculations of, well, just if we had just done the rate of inflation every year, where would we be? Um, we'd actually be 3% higher in taxes if we had just done the rate of inflation. So we're still below the rate of inflation on our tax increase. And so the argument is, is, you know, just as, you know, inflation went up for the groceries, for the gasoline, for everything else, they're going up for your municipal taxes as well. And the hard reality is that uh, um, we have to plow people's roads. They can't, you can't get to work. You can't get to a doctor's appointment. You can't get to school if we don't plow your roads. And it has to be done. We're not talking about frivolous luxuries here. We've, we've cut everything to the bone. Um, you know, uh, we do have uh, 45 minute long debates about whether to spend an extra thousand dollars on Christmas lights every year. Um, you know, when we need to renew our Christmas lights, things like that. So um, it is hard. That, that What you've asked about is sort of the hardest part about this job. And that's looking somebody in the eye and saying, I know it's going to hurt you, and uh, but we still have to do it. And here's why. And some people don't accept that. Interestingly, many people are very understanding of this year's situation and are coming to the support of the councillors that, that that have been happy. And, and by the way, it was pretty well unanimous. There was one one councillor who was the odd person out. Um, we, 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 the, the financial issue is a big issue that is not only facing the people of Lanark Highlands, but across this country. I want to ask, though, Locally, for you, what do you see as the biggest issue facing the township of Lanark uh, Highlands today? And in, in conjunction of that question, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the county that uh, Lanark Highlands resides in as well today? Hmm. I'll start with the county because I think it be a little quicker. Um, we have some aging uh, seniors' homes that need to be rebuilt in order to meet modern code and requirements in terms of particularly things we learned through COVID in terms of housing our elderly people. Uh, we have a reasonably, so we have a, a, a large facility that's aging. Um, Perth is very historic. And one of the historical brick buildings that uh, in Perth is part of this complex. And, it looks lovely, but it, you know you can't drink the water type thing. You can't, but I'm exaggerating to prove a point. So uh, I'd say the biggest thing for the county is is addressing that because it's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars, which is a huge amount for our county, and we'll have to figure out how that's going to be done. At the provincial level, I mentioned earlier the biggest issue right now is the coast gravel pit. Um, it, uh, we have a number of aggregate pits already in Lanark Highlands. Part of the argument that people are making is that we have enough. We don't need more. This one is being built, um, uh, on, uh, on a small lake. And there are actually, uh, a dozen or two dozen properties on the lake. So they're very concerned about their water quality and, uh, the noise. Uh, the application is for a 24-hour day permit. They would be running 60 trucks an hour, one an hour or one a minute, uh, in and out of the, uh, the facility. So the people that live next door to it are not too impressed, or anybody who lives along the route is not too impressed. So the community is very much up in arms. I, I, I say facetiously, I have not received a single letter of support except for the applicant, of course, uh, a big construction company. Um, so that's the big bone of contention in the issue. I'm getting a dozen letters a day on that. Um, we had a public meeting that was so, sorry, 
How Jewish important? How, no, no, I, I muted myself I when you. I coughed. And I, I muted myself when I coughed and I forgot to unmute myself. I want to know because you talk about the letters that you get that are opposed to the gravel pit or the one letter that you got that's in favor of the gravel pit. Letters is one thing. Actually getting out and talking to residents is a completely different thing as well. How important is it for you to not only rely so heavily on people writing in when there's a public hearing or a public open house about an issue, but actually talking to residents about issues? Because you probably have your mind kind of made up before you uh, go in and vote because you're supposed to be open until the actual vote happens. How important is it for you to get that public engagement when making a decision like this gravel pit? Well, I, the short answer is it's very important. And I, uh, I've i been attending, we've had a number of town hall meetings. And so I've attended all of those. And I've, I've spoken to hundreds of people. Um, I will say about the letters, though, this is interesting. I haven't received one form letter. They are detailed. They are three, four, five. I had one that was 20 pages. It, it, it read like a scientific thesis. It was, it was beautifully written. Um, here's my argument. Here's all my facts, basing it up and give it this and credit this. And it was just amazing. So I, I'm not discounting the letters in this case. We had a, we had we've had a couple of letter writing campaigns. They tend to be formatted letters, and I'm a little bit cynical about those and petitions. I think anybody can sign a petition. However, we've got a petition with four thousand signatures in a township of six thousand people. That's pretty good, if you ask me. That's if yeah. that doesn't if that doesn't scream engagement, I don't know what does. Yeah. Now, it, and interestingly, just to come back to your original question, the biggest issue, that's the biggest issue that's on everybody's mind right now. I'll come back to the fact, I think the tax and the budget issue is going to be the bigger long-term issue, because if we can't um, address the service issue, we need to address the service levels issues. We need to, we can't raise 12% taxes and not plow the roads properly next winter. So we have to make sure that money is spent very wisely. And well done, so that in the end, people can say, I don't like it, I didn't want to do it, but I understand why you did it, and you know, we can live with it. Because I guarantee you, you've probably heard this saying, but even if you raise it 1%, there's always going to be that one person that says, you raise my taxes, and I still don't see any benefit or the cost benefit of that 1%. When you raise something like 12%, you're right, you have to go out and actually Hopefully the service levels will improve or people will see the service levels improve. How important is it for you to make sure that people know the service levels that they're getting and what the 12% increase will be going to? Because I'm assuming the 12% is not just towards uh, a new staff member here or there, but hey, this is what's going to happen. New calcium on the road when we gravel or when we sand during the summers or the winters. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, yeah, you, what you're what you're asking about is how do how do we communicate all that? And that's, yeah, communication is the biggest challenge uh, we have because we have so we're very limited in our tools. We don't have communication budgets, ability to do that. I write the odd letter to the editor. I do play around on social media. I'm quite active on uh, the community Facebook pages where people post questions about the township. And I won't always wait in, but I will sometimes. Sometimes people are just venting, and so it, it's not productive to wait in on the social media. But some people are asking specific questions, and I'm able to send the link to the actual answers. Um, yeah, I, I actually was going to, uh, I, I almost, something I was going to raise this year is I'm, I'm not sure um, that our municipality is properly set up in terms of how it communicates with its ratepayers. So I, I want to get a discussion going and talk about how are we communicating, how are we informing people, how do you do that in a way that doesn't seem like you're just being political? Um, you know, it, it, you can, the federal members and the provincial members send everybody a householder, and a lot of them are very, very political and partisan now, uh, so they lose credibility. So I'm, I'm trying to think of something 
that can come out that explains the tax process. Because uh, as I tried to explain to you earlier, and I don't do a great job of it, by the time you figure out the three-way split between police, county, and local or to your government, and uh, what pays for what, and who's responsible for what, it's even within the municipality, half all the roads that come into the main village are county roads. So if you have a, if there's a pothole or a street light 10 feet outside the village, actually even in the village, it's still a county road. Uh, but then all of a sudden we're responsible for plowing it, but not for maintaining it, uh, not for fixing it up and stuff like that. Is it so, hard to communicate that part of the job as well? Because I've heard that like, you, you probably get federal questions asked of you. You probably get provincial questions asked of you. You probably get county questions. You are on county council, so therefore it would be reasonable for you to answer them. But do the, does the average resident of your community understand the different levels of government and who is responsible for what issues? Because I'm hearing from across Canada that that's not always the best uh, – uh, that's not the gauge of what a municipal councillor has to answer when it comes to uh, residents' questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say my answer is I, I think it's confusing for many people, and I do get uh, questions What do you say in that time. sense? I, I just try to ex explain what, it, what, what the breakdowns are. The gravel pit. Um, how, 75 percent of the permitting process is all done by the province not by the municipality so some of these things that they're talking about that people are objecting to we don't even have any control over that and so you need to try to com communicate that to the people to let them know that you should be directing your uh, uh your your uh, your letter to these people over here um, but you don't want to sound like a weasel about it as well. Like it may just sound like you're trying to slough it off or pass the buck on to somebody else. Um, and and sometimes even I'll tell you on the gravel pit, it was very confusing for me. Having worked in provincial government for 20 years, I worked for the Minister of Natural Resources at one point. Um, but and it was confusing for me over what aspects were provincial and which aspects were uh, municipal. And, and the short answer is municipally, the only control we have is over zoning. Everything else, the water, the permitting, the environmental, the studies, the geo, this, the, it's all, it's all the province. I want to turn to my last segment because I, I just realized we're at the almost at the 40 minute mark and I told you 45 minutes. I know the, the great thing about these conversations, they can just feel like they've gone by in a snap. I want to talk about tourism because I like tourism and I've said to every guest who's come on the show, if you come on the show, I'm going to go spend my economic dollars in your community. So get ready to see me in Lanark uh, Highlands later on this year. Um, Bill. In your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems in your community or even in the county that people need to see if they visit Lanark Highlands? Well, I, I mean, the, the, overall, the, the number one thing about Lanark Highlands is the Highlands, just the natural beauty. You go for a drive up in north of the village and up into the country, um, and it's very hilly, and there, there is a mountain and spectacular views. Uh, beautiful lakes, beautiful trees, and just everything that nature has. And then within that, we have a number of uh, uh, well, I was going to say for the outdoor person, hunting and fishing experiences. Um, very active in the in the summer, in the fall, and winter. I actually I know people that hunt year round. Um, our biggest tourism attraction probably is is the place that I mentioned earlier that's near where this proposed gravel pit is, and it's called, uh, uh, let me get this right. Uh, I'm blanking on it now. Wheelers. Wheelers Pancake House. And uh, they've got a website that's a museum. It's a family that started this, uh, I'm gonna say 40 years ago, and they built it up over the generations. They must have 20 family members that work there. They have a museum, they have a petting zoo, they have trails, they have uh, exhibits, they have a blacksmith shop. Uh, they sell, they have a giant log pancake house that was uh, made actually from logs that were, uh, that fell during the ice storm. Uh, 
Uh, we had a big giant ice storm here in eastern Ontario years ago that uh, is quite famous. So uh, uh, anyway, it's it attracts uh, busloads of people from Ottawa, Kingston, uh, even as far as Toronto, and it's uh, quite the place to go. So if you're ever in Lanark Highlands, you need to drop into Wheelers. Where do you what do you do after a stressful day of council or a stressful day at work in the county? Is there a place? Is there a bar? Is there a, a park that you go and just decompress at? Or is it like most counselors who I talk to? I go to my house and I sit in my room and I just watch some TV after a stressful day. What do you do to decompress in the Highlands, uh, Lanark spooky. Highlands? It's spooky that you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they say? Yeah, that's um, what the majority of them say. Well, add me to the list. I just got Starlink. So, you know, I'll uh, go and uh, watch some mindless TV show or uh, uh, actually, I, I just watched the third season of West Wing again the other day. I had to buy it. It kind of pissed me off. I, they have so much free stuff on TV, but I had to, have to buy West Wing. Which is weird because it is one of the best shows out there. Season three is one of the best uh, uh, character arcs for Larry Martin Sheen's uh, Jeb Bartlett. Yeah, absolutely. So no, I I, I I go home to my family and say I've got a wife and two kids and two dogs at home. And um, I try to do a little bit to help out around the household as well. I work during the day and uh, I have a fairly long commute because I work in Ottawa. Uh, Lanark Highlands is about an hour west of Ottawa. So I've got a commute in and a commute home every day as well. So I use so, that, I call that, that's my phone time. I, I do phone calls on my commute. My last question for you before I do my wrap up speech here is what makes Highlands, uh, Lanark Highlands, such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? The people. Um, I mean, and I suppose that can be said about most places. And you know what they talk about the people in Newfoundland being so, that's how I feel about the people in Lanark Highlands. There's a real, uh, as what, we're, we're probably a more depressed area than many parts of the country. Uh, we don't have a lot of wealth. Um, we don't have a lot of fancy services that are available in the cities. Uh, but people come together and take care of each other. Um, I've been with people stacking, uh, doing, you know, fighting floods and uh, helping people whose houses burned down and we have an active food bank and uh, uh, several, uh, we've got a Simiton club. I don't know if you have those out west, kind of like a giant rotary club uh, with a building. Um, and they're very active in the community, uh, holding events all the time. So to me, what attracts me the most is, is, is the people, um, just good people with good hearts. Bill, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this today. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk to someone who's so engaged in uh, wanting to talk about their municipalities and the, the role that municipal governments uh, play in the day-to-day -day lives of Canadians. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And congratulations on your show. And keep it going. It's a great way to uh, engage people and promote the understanding of, of specifics. I appreciate that. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Until next time, just keep talking.